that shattering, I was just like, okay, I never want to put, I never want to be that shattered by one person again. Like I, I need to be more secure and stable inside myself because I was really looking for that security and stability from another person. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 214. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an amazing conversation with Misha. Misha is the co-producer of the Bonobo Network, which Finn will talk more about in just a minute. But we have an awesome conversation around her journey exploring ethical non-monogamy. We also touch on attachment styles and defining what a partner and relationship actually is to you. Yeah, this is a, is a fantastic conversation, and we're thrilled that we were able to, to connect with Misha and have her on the show. As Emma said she's uh, one of the co-producers of the Bonobo Network, which is, uh, and I'm pulling this from their website, this isn't this isn't necessarily my, my <laughs> wording, uh, Bonobo Network is a community rooted in real world and virtual events where people learn together and from one another about sexuality, pleasure, and relationships. So if you've listened to our show before, you're aware that we love community. We're huge advocates of finding community, building community, and doing everything you can to create community around you. And so we're, we're super excited that uh, Bonobo Noble Network is is an is a resource out there and what what they're building. So thank you, Misha. Thank you, William, uh, for building that. Yes. To find out more information, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the podcast tab. There you'll find show notes where you'll find links to the Bonomo Network's website, as well as links for the work Misha's doing and how to contact her. Yes. And before we jump into the interview, we have a couple more opportunities for finding community. Again, definitely check out Bonobo Network. We've been to some of their events in the past and they're amazing. Yes. Uh, we also have some other opportunities for you. So within our podcast, we have our Patreon community, which is full of amazing, open-minded people who are there to support one another. We do monthly uh, video Q&As. We also have a men's group and a women's group, and we have ongoing uh, MeWe chat groups as well. So if you're interested in that, if that sounds like it might be up your alley, head over to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the Patreon tab to learn more about that and to find out how to join. Yes. Additionally, we have a virtual meet and greets that we do every month. And these are open to anyone that wants to join. To find out more information, go to our website again, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the community events tab and you'll find all of the information there. The next virtual meet and greet is this Friday. That's December 17th, 2021 from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We also will have two more virtual meet and greets in January uh, and those dates will be announced soon. And then coming up in February, Emma and I are going to be hitting the road on a little bit of a road trip. Yes. We're, we're heading south and then we're heading west. And so our first stop is going to be New Orleans. And we actually have an in-person meet and greet there on February 7th. Information on how to sign up for that and what that's going to look like is available again on our website. Click on the community events tab and then click on the in-person events or just head to your show notes for yes. your podcast player. <laughs> yes. Uh, and again, the meet and greets are open to anyone that wants to join. Um, also, we will be announcing more meet and greets coming up very soon. If you want to be the first to find out about those events, go join our mailing list on our website. We promise not to spam you. It'll just be information about our events. And again, our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. I just wanted to touch on really quick, for the last couple of minutes, we've been talking about nothing but building community. And I think one of the things that we love about this conversation with Misha, and she touches on this uh, towards the end when she talks about sort of the model for Bonobo going forward, is that like, there's no competition here. The goal is to help all of us build bigger and better communities for non-monogamy because, you know, while there are a lot of us and in comparison or sort of um, with with looking at the perspective of like how many people there really are, there's not that many of us. No. And so uh, the more we can support one another and build each other up and provide access to different communities and different resources, the better. And so I, just, I thought that was important to throw out there that like we know we just threw – 
maybe four different ways to find community and for different events. Um, and I think the more we can do that, the more uh, excited Emma and I are going to be about what we're building here because this is exactly the type of work uh, we've been trying to do and to find people who have been doing it themselves for a number of years is, I don't know, it's really exciting to me and it makes me pretty happy. Yes. So listen to this episode and then go check out the Bonobo Network. Go check out our Patreon community. Go check out the meet and greets. Find all of the community. Find where you fit. And we'd love to see you on any of those places. And we'd love to hear from you. While you're on our website, click on the Contact Us page. Good segue. I know. (laughs) Well, I figured I need to stop rambling. So maybe (laughs) if they send us messages, I'll spend more time reading those and responding (laughs) than talking. So reach out to us. Send us an email. Send us a voicemail. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Maybe you have your own community. Let us know how you've been building yours and found yours and what's been working. So we'd love to hear from you. You'll hear back from us. And maybe I will stop talking officially. Let's go talk to Misha. Let's go talk to Misha. (laughs) Well, welcome, Misha, to the show. We're so excited to have you here today. And we're excited to get to know you a little bit more as well as the work that you do. So thank you for being here. Thanks for the invite. We, you know, we only know a little bit about you, and we'd, we'd like you to introduce yourself for the listeners in, I guess, as detailed as you'd like to get at the moment. Yeah, so I'm Misha Bonaventura. I uh, have uh, am the co-producer of Bonobo Network with William Winters. Uh, we are a sex-positive community based here in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, I have been practicing some form of polyamory, non-monogamy for the last, since I was in my 20s, but there was a period of monogamy that happened in the middle there, uh, but consistently for the last 15 years, and also creating, co-creating non-monogamous, polyamorous, sex-positive spaces for the last 15 years as well. And yeah, it's been a journey for sure. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, I would definitely want to circle back to the work at Bonobo Network because we we actually were, we joined, we were invited to join Pleasure Fest last fall, fall of 2020, mm-hmm. the year that didn't exist. And um, it was awesome in like the way that you all went about like creating consent and safety and all of those things is amazing. And so we definitely want to come back to that um, at a, later on in the the conversation, but do you mind talking a little bit about how you fell into, came into, discovered non-monogamy and what that, what that sort of beginning of that journey looked like for you back in your twenties? Yeah. So I started dating somebody, uh, in my twenties who our first interaction was basically a threesome <laughs> and, um, and that turned into a five-year relationship with, uh, the male man of that partnership. And then he had this lover, uh, and we, I wouldn't say we were a triad, but we were definitely like a consistent threesome for those three years of our five-year relationship. And, at the time I didn't know poly- what polyamory was. I didn't know what we were doing. Like I didn't know it was even a thing. I was just like, yeah, this is, this is what we're doing. And we have this lover and, and she's awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely, there was a moment where I was like, yeah, I think I'm, you know, I'm bisexual and I'm my ideal relationship is to have two, two partners, like like a more like a triad, like a consistent triad where I would have a a female partner and a male partner. And so, you know, in my twenties, I was just like, yeah, that would be my ideal and blah, blah, blah. And then over the five years of that relationship, we really explored a lot. He was very into lots of different subculture, um, subcultures and really introduced me to a lot of interesting things. So we would go to BDSM, uh, parties and play parties. We would go, we would have little mini play parties with our friends. I, we ended up moving out here to California together and, um, 
ended up becoming best friends with someone who was like, let's make a BD, a conscious BDSM video. And we ended up doing this wild video that was, um, I, <laughs> I kind of freaked out was like, no, we cannot release this. I can't become this like video porn star person. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was, it was there. It was in, in my twenties. I, and we also were going to Folsom street fair and exploring, exploring Folsom street. I was friends with somebody who was working with Midori, who is uh, a well-known Dom uh, and teacher, femme Dom teacher in, uh, in the Bay area for many years. She's a little bit uh, of a, a legend. And uh, so I would, you know, like I'd see Midori around and just be like, Oh my God, so amazing. And so, you know, there were just, there were inklings of me wanting to be a sexpert and wanting to explore a relationship. I was open to exploring different kinds of relationships and, but had no mentorship or no, you know, like no real community. Everyone else I knew was monogamous or, you know, dating basically. And so within those five years that I was with this person, um, we, we had a lot of exploration. And then by the end I was like, I think I just want to like settle down and be monogamous or just like be in what, what I was thinking was like, I'm doing this, like either I'm going to go on this wild path of just total different lifestyle than anyone else I know, or I'm going to be monogamous and like find a husband and possibly have a kid or, you know, like that was kind of my mentality at that time. And so I broke up with that partner and decided I was going to find a husband <laughs> and to like went down that path for about a decade and found somebody who I thought was going to become my husband. And, you know, we were on this, on this trajectory and part of that story was that he was really exploring his own purpose. And he had actually broken his back uh, three years before I had met him and had a near death experience and basically was redesigning his entire life while we were together um, based on this near death experience and really finding a new way of working. So he was changing from being a, a tech guy to being a giant squid expert. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. He was becoming a giant squid expert. And, uh, you know, some, something clicked in me that was just like, what am I doing with my life? Like, where am I going with my life? And he really inspired me to really think about what, what do, what would I want to do with my life? If I, if I could, if I had a choice and that led me down to many different paths, but one of the biggest paths has been, um, I guess when we were together, it it was around coaching. I was, I was really looking at coaching and things like that. He, we broke up and that breakup was a catalyst for me to really shift Um, and start to explore my own relationship style and my own sexuality, because that dream, the dream of having a monogamous relationship where, you know, the one, the, the person who I was going to spend the rest of my life with was shattered. And through that shattering, I was just like, okay, I never want to put, I never want to be that shattered by one person again. Like I, I need to be more secure and stable inside myself because I was really looking for that security and stability from another person. And from that major event that happened between us, I started really thinking about, you know, what does relationship mean to me? And I, I started co-producing and co-directing a show called what is erotic in Santa Cruz and that was all about helping people. It was, we did a call to artists. Anybody could perform, create a performance of answering the question, what is erotic to them? And we would help them create it in a way that uh, was stage worthy. 
And then we would, it was kind of like a cabaret style. We would piece a piece together all of the, the, uh, all of the acts, which were like three to six minute acts. And then, have a, a big show, uh, during Valentine's day, um, every year. And from there I became, I started having a reputation of someone who was, you know, really sex positive and, uh, into sexual expression. And that was when I started getting invited to sex parties and sex parties were kind of the way in which I started exploring all of the ways in which I was thinking, um, like I was kind of, I started deconstructing my monogamous mindset basically inside of sex parties and, um, using sex parties for my own self transformation around how I thought about relationship, how I thought about, um, partnership, who was attracted to me, who I was attracted to, who I was jealous of, who I wasn't jealous of, like all of these questions started coming up inside this kind of cauldron of experience that is uh, a sex party. And, um, and so, yeah, I started coming up to the Bay area and exploring relationships. I always wanted a, a partner, but I never was able to like have a very long, uh, like my longest relationship inside of polyamory has been about a year. And I think that part of that is like really just piecing apart some of my inner world of, of how I am, uh, in, in relationship and really getting solid. And just this year, actually, after reading Polysecure multiple times and teaching, teaching Polysecure multiple times, I have started really owning that I am solely solo poly and that my path has been to uh, really love myself in a way that allows me to be centered and also loving others. And, um, and then how do I, how can I get close, you know, how close can I be to other people and allow them to be themselves and allow me to be myself. And through being more oriented towards solo poly, uh, that has really opened up a bunch of doors for me and my relating. Whereas, uh, in the last few years, it's been pretty like me thinking that I am, going to find a partner and then I will feel secure enough in order to like, you know, we'll all have, you know, other lovers or whatever. And it's just like, that's just not how it works. It's just like, that, that's not how my brain works. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and yeah. So anyway, that's where I am now. Yeah. Thank you for that overview um, and wa- walk through the last, how many years of your life? <laughs> um I'm interested in like jumping back a little ways to the, to the beginning in your twenties. And at that time, like, did you have any framework growing up? You said everyone you knew was monogamous, but did you have any framework that non-monogamy existed? Like the, or were you just learning as you went there it was, with your partner? Um, I really feel like I was learning as I, as I went. Um, I think there was a, a I was informed by some, some trauma around in my early teenage years around my father, what was my like framed as my father cheating on my mother, uh, and then breaking up suddenly not realizing that my family was not happy. And so there, I think there is a way in which, uh, I, I want my partners to be happy in, in their choice of being with me. And I think that is very informed by feeling like my family life was a little, was a bit of a lie as I grew up for, you know, 16 years, I found out that they were not happy from the day that they got married. And I was just like, I never want to have that experience. (laughs) And so I'd much rather be alone than be uh, in an unhappy marriage or thinking that we're doing the right thing because 
that's what society tells us to. Right. Or even the staying together for the kids, right? It sounds like that was maybe what was somewhat happening, right? Like, Mm -hmm. well, we're together. We just stick it out for the kids sake. But like that, that also then informs trauma (laughs) when you figure out that, that, you were the reason then your parents were unhappy for whatever number of days, weeks, months, years, right? Like that's tough. Yeah, for sure. I, I didn't want to be put into a situation where I felt like I had to stay with a person who was making, you know, potentially Mm -hmm. making me miserable. Or I I was having a story that they were, you know, that we were miserable together. I just didn't want that. It, It also probably informed me not wanting to have children as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I think, too, like, uh, sort of to build on what Emma was asking about, like, you said your first sort of non-monogamous exposure was, like, your first experience with a partner was a threesome. And I'm just curious, like, that's a, like... Jump right in. Yeah, that's like, (laughs) hey, I'm here, I'm here to go on this date, and then all of a sudden we're having a threesome. Like, could you maybe explain, like, some of the detail around how that happened and, like, how like you show up game for something like that when you've not had any exposure to that and it sort of the jumping off point for all of this. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I would recommend it for per, per se. But <laughs> <laughs> like I, I mean, one thing I've realized about myself is that I um, am attracted to intense people and I like intensity. And I think there's a part of me that, uh, a, a, has has always been a yes for the adventure, partly why I love my my Bonaventura name is like I am you know I am I am a yes for adventure. Who cares about all the feelings that might happen afterwards, you know, or the other part of me that's scared? Like we're not gonna listen to that part. We're just gonna like go for the adventure and the experience. And while that has led me in, in my life to have a really amazing, have really amazing experiences, the things that I think I've learned over time is that there are other parts of me that have wanted to be listened to and that there were parts of me that probably could have used going slower and probably for the other people too, especially the other, um, woman who we were involved with. Like, I don't think we ended proper that, that relationship properly. We didn't, we didn't take care of her. I think it was a very, you know, now that I hear about how people who are unicorns get treated and like the, the critiques that we hear about, uh, the secondary, you know, the secondary critiques, I definitely think we did that to this person completely not knowing completely unintentionally like not taking care of her in fact i i thought she was way more interested in being more way more solo than possibly she actually was because there wasn't a lot of great communication either between all of us so you know um looking back i can see all of the unhealthy kind of tropes and ways in which uh that all played out and um while I loved that experience and I cherish it and I cherish the, the sweetness that I had with, um, with both of those people, I think there were so many ways in which we could have handled all of the, that relationship better. Yeah. Which is, is super interesting, right? Cause that's sort of the, you know, the, the critique that always comes out on unicorn hunting is like, Oh, it, it almost is painted like these people are malicious trying to like take advantage of somebody. And I think a lot of the time it's, we don't know what we don't know. And you don't, you, you're just sort of figuring out as you go. And like, I don't, I just, I, I, I struggle to believe that most people are malicious. I think maybe there are some people out there, but I think the vast majority just are trying to be either protect themselves, protect each other and you just kind of get lost in it and you don't really know until you like you said like you look back in hindsight and you're like oh kind of mess that up and probably hurt this other person because of things that you thought maybe about like you said she was maybe more interested in the independence than mm-hmm. it turns out so i appreciate you sharing that that's super valuable mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah and then <laughs> it sounds like though like that adventure then played out further that you were kind of jumped in with the, with that guy and right. Going to different, you said some BDSM stuff and some kind of jumped in and then you pulled back right a little bit. 
and then squid squid guy happened which is amazing <laughs> i think this is the first Gi- time giant squid <laughs> anyone's been like i attribute my successful career to somebody and giant squid so i love that <laughs> yeah it is quite a unique experience <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that would be an entire podcast on its own, just dissecting that. Um, but yeah, I just, I think it's, it's amazing. And go ahead, Emma, I'm just rambling now. So, well, I'm, I'm curious to kind of what you said a little bit, like what your mindset was, but I'm, I want to dig a little bit more at, you said you had five years of experience with, with your partner that you had the threesome with and you'd experienced a lot of different things. What caused you to kind of pull back and try to find that that husband, as you said? I mean, I think at the time I was thinking either I'm going to stay with this person and this person's going to be my person for, you know, like we're going to get married. That was the track that I thought we were going to be on. And we're going to live this kind of eccentric life. Like this person uh, was... I hadn't even heard of Burning Man at the time. He was already going into Burning Man. They were like, he was, he was really like into subcultures and finding subcultures way, way ahead of like how I find things or, or was thinking about things. So he was exposing me to things that I am now like fully immersed in. And um, and which is ironic because if I would have just stayed with him, we would have just been, like we would have just been on that trajectory. But I think there was something important for me to find my own pathway. And while he was leading and like really exposing me to some things that I probably would have never been exposed to, there was a way in which I was not um, centered enough or secure enough in my own being to make clear choices around where I wanted to go. And the direction that I saw him going were he was starting to have friends that felt like seemed like they were doing more drugs than I really wanted to be part of. And I was like, am I, do I really want to live in a warehouse space for the rest of my life? Like, it it was just like, am I going to be this like eccentric artist person for the rest of my life? Or am I actually going to go down a, some kind of career path and like make some money and like have a husband and possibly have a child, you know, like there were these questions were kind of percolating for me in that, at that time. And it was even, either what felt like eccentricity, like wild eccentric art life or a more, um, normal, I don't know, domesticated, domesticated, domestic, yeah. Life that, that seemed more grounded to me. And, um, and that was the, basically the choice point that I made. And so I was just like, okay, I don't want to marry this person. I don't want to have a child with this person. I am going to go, I'm going to break up with them and like take my own path. And I think it was really important for me as, as my, in my own development to like really start to own some of these things. And it was really interesting that I did come back to a lot of the things that he initially exposed me to. Right. And, and then you kind of talked on about how, in the last, it sounded like about a year and a half, you've done a lot of self-discovery in the coming to the solo poly label or identity, I guess. And like, can you talk a little more about that? Cause they sound kind of interlaced. Like you went down the, like feeling like you needed the security of the long-term partner. And that, that sounds like it maybe stuck around even through quite a bit of the, your, your polyamorous, journey up and uh, again up until pretty recently and like i guess maybe understanding that shift a little more because i think that's a pretty powerful one as well yeah i think my shift uh really came from uh a breakup that i had a little over a year ago right at the um at the beginning of 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 the pandemic was uh, the final breakup. And I think just the stressors of the pandemic on top of a relationship stressor that was already happening, just made it completely blow out and not able and me not able to kind of stick with being with that relationship for longer. But that relationship really showed me some, um, uh, core trauma, core attachment trauma that I, I carry. And, um, 
thankfully, Jessica Fern uh, wrote Polysecure and released it in, in the pandemic. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend everyone read Polysecure. It is one of the best open relationship, non-monogamous books that are out there. And it's really like poignant right, right now. I think it's one of the, the books that is really needed around creating secure attachment inside of non-monogamous relationships. Um, so I ended up reading that and then I ended up doing two book clubs and then I ended up starting to teach Polysecure three times. So I have read this book at least five times over the last year. It has been hugely influential in how I see the world now and how I see everything now as an insecure or secure attachment. And, and if, and as I look through that lens of like, am I feeling secure in this connection, whether it's relating, whether it's my community, whether it's the earth, you know, all of the ways in which she describes how we uh, nested the nested model of attachment, it has helped me to figure out like, okay, so how do I create more security in myself right now? And how do I invite my partners or the people in my life to support more security? And that's the only question I need to ask is like, okay, how do I invite more security here? And whether it's me doing it myself, which is part of the hearts model that she, she, um, offers, or it's in connection with other people, both of those are, are valid ways to create more security. And, um, and it, and it's so, it's such a simple lens to look through, um, that, uh, I've just loved it for one. The other thing is, Um, the being solo poly thing is like, well, I can want partnership all I want. (laughs) Like it it doesn't mean it's there, right? (laughs) Like I'm just like, I would love to have a long-term partner. And in some ways, like my, in, it's part of my mindset where it's like, oh, well, I don't have a romantic nesting person who has been here with me for a long period of time. But, you know, I have my business partner, who William Winters, who is uh, my co-producer in, in Bonobo Network, we have been together as friends. We have had a lovership over time. We are no longer lovers, but we are business partners now. And we are incredibly secure together for the last decade, over a decade. So why do I not count that as part of my partnership and like my secure attachment? Why is it in my head that if I don't have a romantic partner that I am living with, it doesn't count? (laughs) And so part of my own meditation and reframing of how I do life and how I do relationship is that counts. That counts. It's a long-term, steady relationship. We're making life together. We are doing something big, and and that is that is what we do together. I have other people who have also had long-term. I've had long-term relationships with. Why do I not count them as partners in my life? So you know, really see counting that. Like as I talk to my new romantic partners, <laughs> also you know. Esther, as Esther Perel teaches, like stability is not very erotic. And so, you know, just because you have a nesting partner doesn't mean it's very sexy. And like, often they are just platonic, you know, uh, they're platonic housemates as well. And it's like, okay, so why can't I just love my erotic, sexually charged lovers who are more casual and we have a lot of erotic friction and I don't need to yearn for them to be more. I, I want them to stay over there so that we can stay like with our erotic selves and we can have long-term loverships. And then the person who is my housemate, who I don't have sex with, and have a very clean and clear relationship with, and we have tons of fun together, like, why can't that person also be a partner? So, you know, really starting to own and expand the what I think of as partnership and, um, and making my, my relationships count in inside, just inside my head. I mean, obviously they count, but it's just like 
my perception of how I, how I view things and the importance of them and the priorities that I have and my security, all of that, um, is just, a, it's like a deconstructing my paradigm, internalized monogamous paradigms, basically. Which is, uh, not something you just do overnight, right? right? That's a that's a hell of a lot of work. <laughs> um, and I think, like, just something you kind of touched on right at the end was, like, why can't you live with somebody and build a life and you're, you are partners, right? That's just as valid, right? And But like you said, like, a lot of times people who are married and they're supposed to have this super spicy sexual relationship on top of raising kids on top of jobs and all the other stuff. And they often wind up being in these relationships that probably look similar to what, to what you're doing. There's no sex or limited sex and they're, they're co-creating a life. And I think what gets hard there is then there's so much pressure to be like, Oh, well we're married. We're supposed to be like banging like three times a week. And if we're not, we're not upholding like the contract of a marriage and we're not living up to the standards or a and, primary relationship. Yeah. Right. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever label you want to put on it. And so I think it's, it's a sort of throwing out all of the, the expectations and, and re looking at them. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's huge. Like that's a huge shift. So I, I'm impressed and thank you for sharing about like sort of how you got there. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is probably an impossible question, but where do you kind of see yourself going in the future? Um, so my desire right now and what I'm doing right now is um, cultivating secure relationships in all of my realms. And so one of the biggest realm is how do I have both a... Uh, a sexual relationship that is like, how, how is it to stay in the ebb and flow of relating? Right. And so, uh, I know that my attachment system gets very nervous when I have someone who I'm close to and they start to disconnect or go away for whatever reason, It could be that their job gets really hectic and they don't have enough space for me or they don't have as much space as they did before. And then that starts to get me nervous because it feels like they're going away. Or what if they meet another person and their attention is drawn over there and now I'm less shiny or less, less exciting. How, like what happens inside my nervous system And so my desire is to like what I'm cultivating inside myself is to be okay with the ebb and flow of relating. And when, how is it like, can I appreciate when the, when the, when the flow is coming toward me and can I appreciate when there's an ebb and how do I create that balance inside myself where I am both enjoying the connection And I can be a self-resourced enough to like be centered in myself or look at some, you know, be, go somewhere else. If, if the attention isn't there for, from one person, how do I, how do I actually allow my nervous system to be at a baseline of security where I can enjoy the ebbs and flows and the highs and lows, even as there are, you know, someone might be coming or going inside my relationship mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where right, that is not so destabilizing, right? If that, yeah, that transition. Yeah. That's awesome. And again, <laughs> thank you for, for sharing that. And I think that maybe the thought I had on that was, do you do you feel like at this point, if you were to start to develop what maybe started to feel like a primary or somebody who stuck around for longer than a year and it and it really started to be feel like maybe you know, quote unquote more, mm-hmm. would that be something that you would be like open to, or do you feel like at this point you would sort of almost shy away from that because of sort of what you've learned about yourself at this point? Oh no, I totally want to, like, I still want a nesting partner. I still would love to have somebody who plays that role in my life. 
Um, and, you know, at this point there is, uh, there are standards that I have that uh, like in order to get to that place, we would have to have agreements. We would have to like, they would have to be on board with us being sec- like secure with each other. And like that, that is our orientation and that we are tr- like, we are, both playing the game of creating more security for each other and everyone in the ecosystem of our, of our relating. And, um, you know, I would want someone who wants to go to therapy with me or maybe even preemptively go to therapy before we even have any, you know, issues come up. I would want somebody who wants to read books with me. I would want somebody who's like as relationship geeky as I am because, and and who also understands trauma because I do definitely have some trauma in my past that needs a little bit more holding than maybe some, some other people. Although I don't know that anybody doesn't have any trauma. They just don't necessarily know about it or or (laughs) or as, as aware of it as, as others. So, um, yeah, like I would want to have somebody who wants to geek out with me in that way and wants, because we're playing on such a high level relationship game of, you know, multiple people, multiple communications, multiple ecosystems being, you know, integrated or hit or, you know, all of that. I would want that to be, that's probably my main standard of like, what would create a long term relationship for me? Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's not so much you, you're you shunning that. It's you have found the security in not having it um, as much, right? Like you're okay if it doesn't happen, but you're still wi- wide open to it happening and you would love for that. That's sort of what I yeah, picked up I, on was I like think the, my, the kind my, of shift. Yeah, my biggest thing is I want to stop yearning for something different. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm like, I just want to be good with where I'm at and I want to be okay and good with where my, the people in my life are and not having to like grasp for more or yearn for more or be in pain that something else isn't happening. I just want to enjoy what is being offered and like what feels right between us. And I think that's one of the big things for me is I want to find right relationship with each person in my life. And whether that is staying at lovership for the rest of our time together. And like, we possibly see each other at sex parties and, and if it feels right, we get to, you know, we hook up and it's hot and it's great. Or, uh, and we never proceed into trying to like date or, make time for each other or have conversations, um, or to, you know, like maybe it does make sense that we're want to live together or want to live close to each other or want to make bigger commitments to each other. One of the things that's weird about me is like, I'm not looking to buy a house with anyone. I'm not looking to have children with anyone. So like, what are the bigger commitments for me that, that are here? Like there's not some outside thing that's actually, causing the bond to happen that will make us work through some of the harder stuff that might come up. And so it really is about choice with me around like, I mean, unless we buy a house together, maybe that would be the biggest kind of external commitment that I would make with another person. And, uh, and that would mean that we would need to be willing to work through conflict when it comes up in a way, in pretty profound ways. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think just the intentionality behind that, right? Like there's so many people who are just like, woo, we're going to buy a house and have a kid and do the, this and that. It's the relationship escalator. Well, yeah. And they just, without the thought and the like, Hey, maybe let's preemptively get into counseling or therapy. So when there is conflict, we know how to handle it. Like, I don't know. I love the intentionality behind it. Um, well, yeah, because like you said, I mean, pretty much everyone has some sort of trauma or some sort of baggage. Like we're all human. We all live lives. Like there's there's things that are important to um, to discover about yourself and learn about yourself through through therapy and, and any type of relationship. And yeah. um, I also really love what you said a little bit ago about uh, the 
security, finding security in relationships doesn't have to necessarily be romantic relationships. And that really resonated with me because it's so easy, like for you too, like for all of us to go to that place of, of it has to be a romantic, like primary, primary type relationship for it to feel secure. And like, that's what the, my focus is for it to be valid. Yeah, exactly. To qualify as a secure relationship. And it's like, hang on. No, like there's, other types of relationships that you can value and, and have in your life that also can be secure. And can you get the security from that you need from those types of relationships as well? And I think that is like, thank you for sharing that because I think it is so important for all of us to recognize and remember. Um, and also love the book, Polly secure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jessica Fern's, a nested model of attachment is is so brilliant and ability and and then to start to think about even outside of relationships how secure am i with my home how secure am i with my money how secure am i with my with you know my neighborhood all of these things are are ways in which we are securely attached or insecurely attached to these relationships and to start to think and filter through thinking in the, in that way is just that there's so many ways in which you can then make changes in order to feel more secure and, and be a more secure relationship with these, these different types of things. It's just like so many good things to think about. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Right. 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 And so I think like we talked a little bit beforehand about like one of the things we love to talk about are sexual health and safety, uh, consent and bloopers and all of these different things. But I think maybe what would make sense is to, before we get into that, talk a little bit about the Bonobo Network, the the evolution of that, mm-hmm. like when that sort of came into your picture and like how you like how this developed, because I know a lot of the things I just mentioned other than bloopers are really pillars of what, what Bonobo kind of weaves in the the consent, the the sexual health and safety and, and openness. And so I would love to maybe come at it from that approach. Inclusivity. Yeah. That too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Bonobo network uh, came into being uh, 11 years ago. And it was created by William Winters, who is uh, my friend and colleague now. And uh, we knew each other back then when he started just throwing parties at his house for his birthday party. And he started growing the his, his friendship group and his his um, his parties. I was one of the people who were his kind of trusted in his trusted network of advisors, um, we had met at a, uh, another, in another sex party community and had been on council together where we really formed our working relationship and our trusted bond in that, in that community. And then as he started to grow Bonobo, uh, it became clear and the Me Too movement happened. It became clear that, um, it was necessary for a woman's voice to be, uh, ex- expressed in, uh, as, as a leader in leadership in this, um, in, in his community. And so that's when he asked me to join. Uh, so that was about, I think that's four years ago next week. It will be the official, my official, uh, anniversary. And, um, since then, you know, we have just been a power team of growing uh, Bonobo Network into a community of people that are really grounded in our values. And the six main principles of Bonobo is uh, high possibility, low expectation. Lots of things can happen at Bonobo parties or within Bonobo Network, but they may not happen to you. So <laughs> being, <laughs> that's like the short version of, of uh, high possibility, low expectation. Um, the next one is trust and trustworthiness. So entering into a sexual space, you need to have a lot of trust. And if you're entering into our space, then you must be trustworthy in some way because someone has... Uh, has invited you in and also being your most trustworthy 
will help cultivate trust. Uh, consent is obviously uh, a main principle for us um, and very important. And then uh, support. So high challenge, high support is the next one, which is all around like, yeah, sex parties are super fun, but also they can be incredibly challenging and very confronting and can bring up all of your high school shit for sure. <laughs> and so we also, we offer peer to peer support counseling at our parties and in our community in the virtual community space as well. We offer, uh, every weekday we have an angel room, um, that starts at 12 o'clock and runs for an hour. And so people can come if they're having a hard time, they can just come and get a listening ear by peers to talk about what's going on for them. Uh, and then the next one is participation. So we love, uh, everyone participates. We are not just the creators of the space or the hosts. Like we actually expect everyone to be engaged and participate and make offerings and, um, be hosts themselves. And then inclusion is the last one of like, we're very dedicated to creating an inclusive space, um, for as many people as want to join us. So yeah, that's our little run, my little spiel about Bonobo network. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. And I think, I mean, maybe a, an interesting way to approach like what this really like looks like in practice would be like, what was your first sex party experience pre Bonobo? Like the first time you ever went to a sex party versus like, if somebody's like, I want my first sex party to be a Bonobo sex party. What is the, like the, the contrast between what you can create or what you've created versus like you what know, you experienced. Your, <laughs> your first experience or like maybe, a paint with a broad stereotypical brush of like what, you know, other experiences to be like, tr you know, traditionally. Yeah. I mean, I think in my, in my twenties, when I was going to, um, public sexy spaces or, you know, bigger BDSM parties, um, there was a range of experiences, you know, the, the practices around letting women in and making men pay double and, you know, all of these kind of practices that seem like they would balance the gender issues, but actually create more, more issues. Um, I was definitely groped non-consensually at, in sexual spaces like, uh, that, and, and also I think some of the ways in which we are trying to solve for problems around like creepiness or, you know, you hear about, you go with your partner and, and are having sex. And then all of a sudden you look up and there's like five people jerking off around you. Like, ah, scary, like not consensual, you know, watching is yeah. also participating or, and then also like uh, touching yourself at people. <laughs> it's just like, Oh geez, this is not good. Right. And like, how do you create safety inside of these spaces? How do you actually create sexual interaction, social, sexual space that feels good to people that actually feels safe, trustworthy, um, consensual, like how do you actually create a whole culture around that so that the creepy vibe, the, that women don't get scared off or women and non-binary people don't get scared off. Like how do you make it so that they're not just hungry people trying to get, 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 and that we're actually having a collaborative, interactive invitation based, um, experience where, um, everyone feels excited to be participating or at least like everyone is there treating each other like humans, not like sex objects. And, and so that's really like what I like, why I come back over and over again and why I am creating these spaces is because I want humans, but especially women and non-binary people, um, to feel safe in sexual space because it's ridiculous to think that women are not sexual beings or don't want to like be super sexually expressed because I can tell you right now, 
or when women feel safe and uh, are at their full sexual expression, everyone else has a really fun time. (laughs) And, and so, um, like how do we actually create a culture where that is, that is cultivated instead of what we have now in broader culture, which is, uh, mostly fearful, both sides are fearful, you know, all sides are fearful. There's, you know, sexual violence is prevalent. People feel microaggressed or taken from Uh, other, you know, men often say that they feel blamed or like they can't do anything now, you know, like how do we like unravel all of those, these dynamics so that, we're creating a culture where sexual expression feels safe, fun, consensual, exciting, that the tension is there, that people are, are, yeah, like it's, 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 it's creativity at its core. Um, so that's why I keep coming back over and over again, even when it's hard, even when I'm not having a good time, even when, you know, things happen that are difficult or painful. This is, this is, I've, I've definitely found my, my own purpose, my own giant squid. Right. Exactly. <laughs> the exactly. giant squid is a metaphor at this point for, for <laughs> your, your beacon in life. Yeah. The, cr- the yeah. crash in my crash in calling is <laughs> social sexual spaces. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, like, I mean, uh, all of that is absolutely amazing. And I think, you know, you, you you threw out one thing that was, like, the antithesis, right? Like, oh, we're going to charge men double and we're going to let women in for free. And that's going to make it better, right? And turns out that actually often makes it worse. It, obviously, you don't need to give away all of the secrets, but are there, like, one or two things that you have found to be, like... Things that work? Things that do work. <laughs> things that do help create this that like somebody could maybe make is like, Hey, I'm throwing a house party with 10 or 15 couples. Like what is, what are a couple of things I can do to get closer to a bonobo model? Um, yeah. easily, maybe easily. And I know it's never an easy thing, but like some, some of like the, the biggest game changers maybe. Yeah. So just so you know, everything that we do is open source and it, anybody is able to co- go to our website and look and see what our, we have a consent policy that's open source. If anyone wants to use our consent policy, we just ask for attribution. So we're really, you know, our focus is for, to spread sex positive community, sex positive, sex positivity in general, as far and wide as possible. There's no competition here because it is just just getting started. You know, this is just getting started Mm -hmm. in life and we are team players with everyone. Very polyamorous in our business model as well as our relationship style. Um, yeah, I love that the the abundance <laughs> abundance mindset, right? That like you don't you don't want to have the monopoly on. Hey, we're the only safe sex party in all of North America because <laughs> we know the secret. Like that doesn't help. Yeah, what anybody. good is that deal? Right, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there's there is a huge market for <laughs> safe for like amazing sexual spaces for sure, and we are just you know, like we are just the, like, I don't want to say tip of the iceberg because there's many people doing this work, but there are like lots of, um, lots of room for more innovation and more, um, doing things better. So we encourage everyone to like start their own spaces. And that's going to be one of the things that we're going to start to offer is I don't really want to like create more bonobo parties in all different parts of the world. I just want to teach people how to create their own communities that work for them and show them what we've learned, um, and, and let them create their own spaces. So that's part of our model of, of kind of teaching people to fish, to keep on with the squid metaphor. Uh, and, (laughs) uh, (laughs) um, and yeah, so some of the things, some of the tips that I would say is, if you're just doing your house party, like, you know, at some level, the game that we're playing is, is even more than, than where me, people would be starting off on. So it, it can be a little hard for me to orient, like, you know, 
payment plans and things like that for people. It's just like, that's like so beyond what people actually need to, to know about. But, um, yeah, understanding what your, who your guest list is and like how to even make invitations to your friends, right? Like people thinking about like, oh, I'm just going to invite my friends over and then it's going to become a sex party. Like actually that's such a huge jump from where you actually, where you probably need to start, which is more like a cuddle space or like, like finding out if you and your friends want to actually be touching each other could probably be a good step. <laughs> like, Hey, maybe we start to create a, uh, a culture where we are able to cuddle with each other and it doesn't mean anything except that we're like touching each other and feeling good and like creating the oxytocin that is fun and sweet. And like that could, that is like a baby step. Going dancing is another amazing way to have like both sexual, sexual tension because you know, sexy dances are so fun, but also safe container of the dance. You're just there for three minutes and then you're, you're parting ways, things like that. So those are all cuddle party, um, by Marsha Brzezinski and Reed Mahalko, amazing resource to start, um, cuddle spaces or creating consensual cuddle spaces with your friends to jump to like sexy parties I think finding people that are interested in that can be, uh, especially if you're not in like a major urban area can be a little difficult. So maybe going to, um, sex, sex store, like, uh, toy stores, sex toy stores that have, uh, that have classes. So going like starting to go to classes, starting to go to burlesque shows or other sexy spaces that will, that where you can start to meet people that are interested in sex, sexuality, relationships, things like that. So yeah, like the jump between we're all, we're friends or like, we're interested in this to like, we're going to have a sex party. It can be a little bit tricky, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, yeah. I think the other things might be if you are starting to like decide to want to have a sex party, figuring out who would be good matches for that. So you want like, especially if it's a smaller crowd, like you don't want to bring someone who's just going to be like going to feel very out. So you want you want to mm-hmm. make sure that people it's a cohesive group of people and then build from there and then they can bring their friends or they can bring people and make sure that people feel included. So having icebreakers, having a, a opening circle is a really great way to have everyone be on the same page. I love our closing circles. We have uh, at the end of our parties, we have a closing circle that talk where people can just name their experience, whether it was hard or whether it was uh, ecstatic um, and just have all that in the pot and learning and understanding things like that. Also as an event producer, dealing with consent violations is probably the worst part of your job and that you will quickly find out that like, it's not as fun as it, (laughs) <laughs> the event producer part can be uh, very challenging in that regard. Yeah, yeah. You go to a sex party to work instead of enjoy the sex, right? You're, you're. <laughs> it's, it's a job at the end of the day, right? So I yeah. can understand that. And thank you for sharing all of that. It's hugely, hugely appreciated. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And if people want to find out about more about the Bonobo Network, what's the? Is there your website the best place to find you? Yeah, bonobonetwork.com is our brand spanking okay. new website. And uh, you can find all about it, uh, everything about us. You can apply. There's an application to get into Bonobo Network. We have an online community, so it doesn't matter if you're in the Bay Area or not. You can still join our online community and potentially come to a retreat or fly out to a party if you want to actually experience our events. But the, the virtual community is, is very robust and, and active and fun, and it's easy to meet people through the virtual spaces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Amazing. And they just have to do the application on our website to get into that. Yeah. Uh, the, there's an application, there's a membership fee, and an orientation, and, and they get in. And um, okay. yeah, 
And we also do coaching, one-on-one coaching or couples coaching, things like that. And I also am a mediator and consent and accountability coach. So if anyone's having a hard time, if they've gotten accused of a consent violation, things like that, I'm very happy to help with that kind of yeah. Awesome. Those kind awesome. Of issues. Thank you. And and links to all of that will be in the show notes as well. So I think like maybe building on that and maybe just kind of a couple of final things. Like one, wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about anything that we didn't ask about that that was on your mind that you wanted to share. And also having been to probably at least a few sex parties in your day. Uh, we'd love to hear maybe a funny story or two that, that comes to mind, either for, for yourself or maybe you witnessed it happen. You know, I, I had this great story the other day. I always go blank when these, when people ask, and now I need to start writing them down so that I can like remember the funny stories. Cause we definitely, I definitely have all kinds of funny stories. I just go blank when they, when people ask me one of the, um, one of the most surprising things that ever happened was, uh, do you know what a magic wand is? It's like, um, the long mm-hmm. magic yes. wands that they have, um, We're familiar. So the Hitachi, <laughs> the Hitachi magic wand, put a bl- plug in for Hitachi. Okay. Um, so what I didn't realize is that if, uh, I had some sa- sa- sadistic friends and if you put the Hitachi on the edge of a person's nose, they will sneeze uncontrollably. And as really, part, yeah. <laughs> and as part of a scene, uh, I had two um, partners who were ganging up on me basically and decided that that would be a really fun thing to make Misha sneeze over and over and over again for a while. So that was kind of a thing that you don't normally see at a sexy party, but you know. <laughs> it starts to get oh, really now creative. You are, right. I was like, you want to bet that there's a lot more people now going to try that. <laughs> In, including your host. Yeah. <laughs> Let just, uh, you know, get your sadist, you put your sadist hat on and be like, okay, I, we're really going to, I'm really going to torture you and feel, <laughs> make you sneeze, make you sneeze re- really ridiculously. I mean, I also just love, like, I have loved more and more using sex and sexuality as a transformational tool. And so I've designed scenes for myself, um, to like support myself in, in my own transformation. And, uh, last, last, uh, birthday, I created a, uh, a a birthday party with all of my friends. So we were all like, young, you know, young Misha with young friends. And then I transformed myself into my own, uh, daddy adult. And now I have this whole daddy persona and playing with my own, uh, my own daddy, my own, you know, sexual dominant daddy persona. And, uh, that has also been really fun. So like, I mean, part of what's been amazing about being like seeing other people having sex, like real people having sex at sex parties. One, it's just amazing to see how beautiful people's bodies are and like really breaking apart the paradigm that like you have to be a certain body type or a certain look to, to be beautiful. And, um, to like really see real people having real sex and in their, you know, imperfect body, beautiful bodies is just amazing. The other thing is, um, really playing with gender, like really expanding the idea of like, what is gender? What gender am I? Where, what body parts do I have? You know, strapping on a cock and, um, embodying my masculine things like that, like really shifting out of this idea that we are playing certain roles and are in certain bodies and you can only be that, uh, I think is one of the most amazing things about the sexual spaces that I occupy is like, I love seeing people of all genders in our spaces playing, and, um, playing with their gender. I love seeing men for the first time putting on 
nail polish and dresses and stockings and playing with their gender for like, you know, and, and we've had a lot of people say for the first, like I've gotten to play in this realm for the first time and really be self-expressed. And I feel so free. It's just like, I love that that is available in our social sexual spaces. So, um, and you know, it, it, it's not for everybody, but I love that it's just available, right? Like if you want, if you Mm -hmm. want it, you can, you can be that expressed in our spaces. And I, and I, I really, that really warms my heart. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing too, because it is so important that, like you said, not for everybody, but that doesn't matter because there, it may be for somebody and, or maybe for lots of people and that, that it's a safe space for people to express themselves in whatever way feels right to them, um, is important and powerful. And thank you for creating that space yeah. and co-creating that space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And is there anything else that we haven't talked about, um, that you wanted to get out into the world before we let you, uh, get on with your afternoon today? I don't think so. I feel like we covered a lot of ground. <laughs> yeah. We did. We, we have a way of doing that in an hour. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it happens, but um, a huge a huge amount of gratitude and thanks for, for coming on, for creating all the spaces you've created, for just, yeah, open sourcing the the wealth of knowledge you, you have. And just, yeah, thank you so mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. Yes. And have a wonderful rest of your day. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for inviting me on. And we're back. A huge thank you to Misha for coming on the show, sharing your story, and for, of course, of course, the amazing work that you do with the Bonobo Network. Yeah, I can't. I Obviously, I talked ad nauseum in the intro about <laughs> how important it was. So thank you, Misha. And I just wanted to give a quick update on one thing that Misha talked about that I promised uh, Emma and I were going to try, and we haven't tried it yet. The Hitachi trick. The Hitachi trick. Yeah. We have not gotten to that. Um, to be honest, I don't know that we've we've had an opportunity. Uh, well, well, yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. Maybe next week. We'll have an update <laughs> for you next week on this. So uh, I'm excited for that one. I don't know who's going to be the sneezer. I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> Maybe we'll both take a turn. <laughs> Anyway. Yes, anyway. Uh, Thank you again, Misha, and we're excited for what you're building. Thank you for building it. Yes, and go check out the bonomonetwork.com. Also, go check out our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. There you will find podcast show notes. You will find information about our upcoming virtual meet and greets. The next one is this Friday, December 17th, and we'll have more in January as well. You'll also find information about our upcoming in-person events starting in New Orleans on February 7th, and you'll find all the information about our incredible Patreon community. There's a lot of information on that yes. website. Yes. The last thing you'll find over there really quick is links to get tested for STIs and save yourself $10. Emma and I use a service, stdcheck.com. We've been using it for years. We love it. So if you are finding your community and that community means you get to meet people in person and maybe have some intimate time together. Have some fun. Have some fun. We highly recommend getting tested and knowing your status so you can talk confidently about your sexual health with your partners. If you use the links on our website, again, you save $10 and it helps support the show. So we thank you in advance for that. And next week, we have another amazing interview. With Michaela and Paul. Not to be confused with the Michaela from last week. A different Michaela. Different Michaela (laughs) and different Paul, even though last week wasn't a Paul. Right. (laughs) So we're excited for that. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. We will see you Friday at the meet and greet, the virtual meet and greet. Virtual meet and greet, December 17th. And then we will see you again next week for our regularly scheduled programming. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.